Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Bricktown Urban Design Committee meeting um, of February 9th, 2022. My name is Ophelia Cancio, and I'm the chair of the committee. The following guidelines are in place for meetings in the council chamber at City Hall. Only the south entrance to City Hall will be open for access to the building. For exiting the building, all accesses can be used. Air purifying machines have been installed in the chamber and hand sanitizer machines and disposable face masks will be available. When called on, applicants and speakers will come forward to the front podium to speak. Only one person at a time should come to the podium. Please speak into the microphone, identify yourself, and provide your address for the record when you begin speaking. Address your comments to the committee. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Citizens may address the committee on agenda items by responding to the chair's call for speakers during discussion on each item and signing the speaker's log on the podium. All comments must be relevant to the item being heard. The chair or presiding officer may be in his or her discretion prohibit a person from addressing the committee and or remove that person from the council chambers if that person commits any disorderly or disruptive behavior. Please refer to the meeting agenda for more information about these requirements. If you parked in the Sheridan Walker parking garage north of the John Rex Elementary School, staff, staff can provide you with a parking validation ticket. The agenda and the documents are located at the okc.primegov.com um, address. You, 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 would select in the, you would select the Bricktown Urban Design Committee meeting. Once there, you would then click on an agenda item and the re related documents will come up below the item. Desiree, will you please call roll? Committee member Cancio. Present. Committee member Wall. Present. Committee member Dotson. Present. Committee member Egan. Present. Committee member McGowan. <laughs> <laughs> Committee member Scaramucci. Absent. Committee member Thompson. Absent. Okay, so the uh, uh, go, go ahead and uh, have approval of the December eighth, twenty twenty one meeting minutes. I'll motion to approve the minutes. Okay. Motion to approve. I wasn't on. <laughs> oh wait, uh, is this live? I don't remember now. See, this is ridiculous. I'm, I'm sorry. Hit the button. All right. Yeah. Did we have a? Did someone second the motion? Uh, I'll second. Okay. Here is coming up. Sorry, we're too used to. Still waiting for responses. Someone seconded. Yeah. Well, it usually it should populate here with the buttons of moved by. Yeah, it's not. It's not showing up. Do we want to record it or it's not showing up on the portal? Yeah, Desiree, we may need to do a voice vote for this one. It's not. Committee member Cancio. Oh, yes. We're going to do a roll call vote because PrimeGov is not registering oh, okay. people's votes. Sorry. Committee member Cancio. Do I do I need to vote? So you're just going to verbally vote. Oh, okay. Aye or nay? Okay. Yeah. Aye. Sorry. Yes. Aye. Committee member Wall. Aye. Committee member Dotson. I'll abstain. Committee member Egan. Aye. Committee member McCowan. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was only 12 minutes late, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Committee member Scar Scaramucci. 
Absent. Committee member Thompson. Okay. So that motion passes. Um, four ayes, two abstains, one absent. So we can move to the next agenda item. Okay, thank you. So um, there are no cases withdrawn. There are no continuance requests. Um, we have a item on the consent docket. It's a BCA 2100025 at 25th South Oklahoma Avenue, um, application by Nathan Hendricks, true facade for Melinda McMillan Miller, Oklahoma City Parks and Recreation Department to install artistic lighting on the north side of the canal at the canal level beneath the overhead canopy. Um, Uh, the item has been placed on the consent docket because staff has reviewed it uh, in comparison to the applicable development regulations and design standards or design guidelines and found it to be compliant with uh, all applicable regulations and guidelines and we're recommending approval to the committee. So yes, you all, if anyone has questions, you can ask those questions of staff, or uh, if there are no questions, the committee could um, make a motion to approve the item. Are there any questions? I, I, I'd just like to say I, lo I love this project. I love that we're doing this. I think it's great. Um, hope we get to do more and more of this kind of thing. Uh, it was a both DOKC uh, Downtown Partnership was involved, and there was a ULI grant. So two great organizations. Thanks for recommending it. Um, thank you to planning staff and I move that we recommend to approve. Second that. Second that. <laughs> I guess it's popping up on your screen. So yeah, if we can do, so the, if you can register that the motion is I'm signed Bye. in. I just okay. Oh, here, let me see. Oh, we'll get you there. That, that I'm there. Good, you can have it. I don't care. Okay. Oh, why is it? That's not the right one. Okay, so it should pop up to vote now. Oh, oh there we go. Yes, okay, so now you can vote. Okay. The motion passes. So we'll move on to the next item. The cases for there are no cases for individual consideration. Um, so on other business to provide a recommendation for an ordinance relating to um, advertising and signs, repealing Article 5 of Chapter 3 of the Oklahoma City Municipal Code 2020 and amending the Articles of Chapter 59, uh, 4, 5, 6, uh, sorry, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and, is that 10? 13. 13, sorry. Yeah. Of chapter 59 of the Oklahoma City Municipal Code of 2020 to update sign regulations in design districts to delete provisions regarding non-accessory signs to authorize administrative approval for certificates of approval for murals in design dis districts and intacting a new article, is that 15? Uh, sign, sign, reg, 21? 16. 16. Sign regulations of chapter 59 of the Oklahoma City Municipal Code 2020 to provide for new sign districts and street typologies to set forth standards for types of signs to provide for administration and enforcement. 
to provide for the measurements of science and to add definitions. Okay, good morning, Lisa Chronister, Assistant Planning Director. It's good to see everybody. I'm not sure I've seen most of you in person <laughs> in um, many months. Uh, so it's good to be here, yes, uh, to talk about uh, the uh, proposed new sign code and ask you for your recommendation. I did present um, uh, an uh, overview of where we were uh, on uh, the code draft last January, so January 2021. And uh, now we're back uh, with uh, what we believe to be the final. So I will, um, uh, since it's been a year, uh, I'll talk to you about you know, what the project is about, what we're trying to achieve, the resources and information that we've used uh, to create it, talk about why signs need to be addressed now, um, talk through uh, some major elements of the new sign code and talk about where we are in the process. So the purpose of the project, uh, the code update project in general, is to implement Plan OKC, which is our comprehensive plan that was adopted in 2015, and it's been amended uh, a couple of times since then, but, but the whole purpose of Plan OKC is to get the types of development we want to see and to make it easy to do uh, the right things. Uh, the sign code was always a part of the code update uh, project and um, uh, the whole project is a multi-year, multi-phase uh, project, but in early 2020, planning staff was asked to accelerate development of the sign code. So um, at your uh, commissioner training on March 4th, um, uh, you will hear uh, uh, some more in-depth information about the whole rest of uh, the zoning code update. So you can look forward to that. So we were asked to accelerate uh, the sign code and move it ahead of the rest of the work. Uh, so why, with everything that's going on in the world, uh, why were signs a priority? Uh, one, there were some specific Plan OKC policies saying we needed to address signs. We had a phase one code diagnosis that made some other specific uh, recommendations. Part of what made it time sensitive were some recent rezoning applications in front of planning commission and city council that resulted in city council passing a moratorium on using uh, PUDs and SPUDs to install billboards. And that moratorium is still in effect uh, through May of this year. Uh, there were some recent court cases, including one that the city uh, was involved in uh, that started to question the extent to which municipalities could uh, regulate signs by content. And then there were um, uh, several uh, concerns from businesses, residents about uh, things uh, that needed to be improved in the code. So Plan OKC against our comprehensive plan, um, you know, it's, it said specifically we needed to adopt a citywide, new citywide uh, sign code. Um, some of the goals of that sign code uh, it articulated were to reduce sign clutter, to improve sign aesthetics, specifically to restrict billboards, restrict new ones or eliminate existing ones and uh, to consider new limits on the size, height, and number of signs. Uh, so while that does seem pretty specific, there was a lot to untangle. You know, what is sign clutter? Your definition may be different than my definition. Um, you know, what is an improvement to the aesthetics of signs? We had lots of debate in our focus groups and stakeholder team meetings about what did improvement mean? You know, how much to reduce? or eliminate billboards. Uh, our uh, phase one co-diagnosis, which was done in uh, 2017, um, it also uh, uh, highlighted the need to create a more uh, highly graphic and user-friendly code. If you know our code now, it, it's reams of text, hardly any illustrations. Um, it was uh, one of the first documents to rec recommend that we look at content neutral sign standards. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And uh, really encouraged anything we could do to make uh, the development review process more streamlined would go a long way uh, toward uh, improving development. So why content neutral? 
So our existing sign code is organized into regulations for accessory signs and non-accessory signs. Accessory signs are defined as, as signs related, whose messages are related to the business or the use operations of the building or property on the site. And then non-accessory signs are ones that have messages not related to the use or business on the property. So that's typically considered advertising. So, you know, if I have a restaurant on site, it's Lisa's restaurant, that's an accessory sign. Um, and uh, the, the problem with that, the court is increasingly finding, is that um, a code enforcement permit desk, you have to, based on what the sign says, dictates what uh, guidelines and regulations you are to follow. And um, obviously that's a big uh, First Amendment uh, issue. Um, so there are a lot of court cases um, in the last uh, five years or so that look specifically at that issue and all of them are finding that, um, that, it's, uh, it, that codes uh, that regulate based on content are uh, impermissibly um, uh, infringing on First Amendment rights. One of these uh, that was a court case that the city was involved in in 2019. And what makes that more significant is that the city represented to the court in response to that case that, hey, we're in the middle of a code update, we have a consultant, we're already looking at how to make our code content neutral, you know, we're working on it. So that really um, uh, catapulted uh, the content neutrality issue and working it through the code um, uh, up, up to the top of priorities. So, uh, so that's, that's why it's important to get to content neutral. Um, there's some other aspects of that. Um, it has been uh, very difficult um, uh, for staff in planning department and development services to interpret signs based on what they say. It becomes an issue, especially for electronic message displays, which I know we've had that discussion in, with this committee. So if we're not gonna regulate on content, then the focus of the regulations has to be on, on things we're all regula already regulating on the traditional basis of sign regulation, which is the size, the number, the height, the type, the location, whether it lights up, whether it's an EMD or not, what it's made of. There are uh, tons of objective criteria we can use to regulate signs other than messages. So to uh, develop the code, we've done a, a ton of research in the past two years. We've assembled various focus groups. Um, we have, uh, we work with a stakeholder advisory team uh, that some uh, members of this committee uh, also serve on. Um, we've uh, talked to planning commission, we've had city council briefings, we've had uh, meetings with uh, industry, with uh, developers, with realtors, uh, with artists, um, and uh, internal staff, code enforcement permit desk uh, to uh, figure out what all the um, issues are, what all the concerns were, and more importantly, how we could address them in the new code. So in all those meetings, um, uh, we heard a lot of feedback about, yes, can we please streamline some of the approval processes? Um, yes, can we make uh, all the criteria just as objective as we possibly can so that it's easy to, for, for users, you know, residents, businesses, code enforcement, permit desk uh, to use? Um, can we improve code enforcement of signs? And I'll go into more detail about that later also. Um, uh, one thing that brought signs uh, to the forefront was the increased use of SBUDs, uh, simplified planned unit developments to allow billboards where they weren't um, already allowed. Um, was, was that the right uh, planning process? Was it the right tool to uh, permit billboards? 
So that got us to uh, the proposed sign code. Uh, we think uh, benefits of the new code are that it um, for sure is content neutral, which should avoid difficult interpretations. It's highly graphic with illustrations, easy to read tables. It will uh, provide for um, fewer dilapidated signs by making it easier for the city to enforce um, sign conditions. Uh, we um, are specifically limiting uh, the use of PUDs and SPUDs uh, to vary sign standards. Um, we've, uh, pr we're proposing a way to streamline the murals approval process. Um, uh, we think uh, there's benefits for residents and businesses um, uh, related uh, to all of these changes. So, um, and the, the big picture of uh, the code update is that it establishes a new Article 16 uh, that will replace a certain article of Chapter 3. So everything in Article 5, Chapter 3 will move to this new, sec new section in Chapter 59. A lot of provisions have not changed, they've just been moved. And this particularly applies to Bricktown because Bricktown is the only design district where most of the regulations and guidelines were in chapter three. And now they, they are moving to uh, chapter 59. Um, for the most part, uh, design district specific standards have not changed and they supersede anything that's in the base sign code. The new code will be hosted online if you if you've, uh, are accustomed to accessing the code online via MuniCode. Um, that's how you would access this code. Go to MuniCode, Chapter 59, Article 16. You'll see this page. The, um, then uh, click on Article 16. It'll take you to um, um, uh, the uh, table of contents for the individual sections. Uh, related to the types of signs, and from there uh, you can click through to find uh, your requirements. The uh, new code uh, reorganizes uh, most of uh, the regulation information into easier to read tables, so you read across the top to find your zoning district, and then read through the table to find uh, your size, height, number, as opposed to turning back and forth between uh, written paragraphs. And you can see again, because Bricktown is the only design district um, where, most, where most of its specific standards are in chapter three, uh, so it has its own column. Then uh, every sign type, um, at every table is accompanied by illustrations um, and photographs to more specifically communicate, hey, this is uh, what we're talking about in terms of uh, signs and how the regulations are to be applied. Then one uh, feature uh, we think is gonna be really great, and uh, when this is live and, and public, is the calculator feature. So, um, you know, when you, uh, are in uh, Article 16, uh, you can click on the upper right, and then on the left-hand toolbar, pick the type of sign you want to use, pick the zoning district you're in, and fill out things like the size of the wall or the um, street typology, and it will calculate um, and present all of your requirements on the page for you. So again, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if we have um, accomplished nothing else, uh, we think this will be um, a huge improvement. Uh, not Again, you know, we're talking for residents, businesses, and uh, staff also. Um, uh, two things uh, that um, have kind of structurally changed about the way signs are, would be assessed in the new code are, uh, one, uh, freestanding signs are uh, regulated by street typology. Right now in the code, they're regulated on uh, like street frontage, but this is a street typology as articulated in uh, Plan OKC. 
um, and what that is intended to accomplish is, hey, if you're on, if you're on a busy arterial street, um, you get a bigger signs, bigger, taller signs. If you're on a, a smaller neighborhood main street, uh, that's a smaller sign. So the size of the freestanding sign is relative to the intensity of the street. So, so that, that is new. Something we're changing is how signs are measured. Uh, we heard a lot of feedback uh, from uh, industry and property owners uh, that uh, they needed more flexibility in how text was measured other than the simple rectangle that is used now. So uh, we're making it, uh, changing it to a multi-sided polygon and what that will do is free up a more uh, area for um, decorative um, shapes and um, things like pole covers or stone bases, things that now are calculated as part of sign area that we've heard from businesses they would like to do, but they don't do it now because they don't want to lose, it's cutting into their sign allowance. So some specific changes uh, to uh, run through really quickly. Um, most of these do not specifically affect a bill, uh, brick town, but I want you to be aware of them. Uh, billboards are, rem are, are they're prohibited in, in brick town now. This code will not change anything about that. Uh, for other areas of the city, it, um, it um, mostly keeps existing size, height, and spacing requirements, but it does add some conditional uses in C3, DBD, and I1 that will result in smaller, shorter billboards. And again, we are uh, specifically limiting the use of PUDs and SPUDs uh, to uh, increase sign allowances, including for billboards. So, uh, uh, PUDs, like I just said, um, you cannot use those to increase sign standards. You still would be able to use them to decrease sign standards. Another uh, thing we heard in outreach was um, applicants asked, hey, is there any way we can accommodate some administrative flexibility for small changes in size or number or height? instead of having to go to Board of Adjustment, which is time consuming and expensive when there are often some just very small um, adjustments that would uh, uh, make, a, make a big difference in the development. So we looked at what other cities did and one of those was establishing a process for a master sign plan that applicants can, uh, you know, plan out all of the signage on their site, come in for director approval, planning director, or his designee, um, to, uh, you know, increase, you know, 10%, 10 to 15% in terms of number, height, and area. So, again, that'll just be an administrative process, no fee, no uh, board of adjustment. Code enforcement. Uh, back to this idea of community appearance, sign aesthetics, we heard a lot of feedback that, hey, you know, the number of signs, the height of signs, the size of signs, that's not the issue. The community appearance issue is dilapidated signs, signs that are broken, busted, wires hanging out, that's the issue. Uh, so uh, to uh, increase the city's ability to address those, uh, we are proposing that um, the city be given the authority sim to remove them, similar to the authority the city already has to remove uh, dilapidated buildings. Um, so we've uh, clarified that in the code. We've um, improved the, the definition of abandoned to make it more precise so that it helps code enforcement when they go out, they can say, okay, you know, the face is, is broken, the wires are hanging, are loose. I can uh, cite you for, uh, for uh, the um, property maintenance. 
Um, same thing for strengthening definition of not maintaining good repair. You know, what does that mean? And then um, we're also proposing um, that uh, we remove the requirement that only si licensed sign contractors can remove signs. We heard from several stakeholders that that was an impediment, that you know, Mr. McCowan can't just remove the dilapidated sign from his property without engaging a sign contractor. Uh, so obviously there are some limits uh, on that in terms of if you need a licensed electrician, but the point is how can we make it easier to remove dilapidated signs? Attached signs um, uh, in the new code uh, makes them all relative to uh, the size of the wall, not the size of the building. Um, uh, the uh, one thing we heard uh, concern about was if we are getting rid of this distinction of accessory and non-accessory signs, stakeholders were concerned, well, what's to keep all the businesses from selling their extra sign area for advertising? And our response was, well, there is nothing because we're just looking at the size of the sign, the location of the sign. But in response to that concern, we wanted to make sure that our attached sign area was was as tailored as it could be. Because the existing sign code now allows a lot more sign area than anybody is using. Uh, I have some facts, some numbers on that. Let me, so yes, in, so in Bricktown, existing signs used an average of only 4.44% of the total wall area. The highest usage, the biggest sign is only using 13% of the wall area. So by, we, we believe by um, reducing uh, the allowed attached sign area that will allow businesses to have the signage they need but um, limit how much extra is available for, site, for what we would normally consider as advertising. Pole signs um, are, uh, remain uh, prohibited in Bricktown except for uh, multifamily residential uses. Uh, we are uh, incentivizing the use of monument signs instead of pole signs by allowing slightly bigger ground signs than pole signs. Uh, electronic message displays, um, again, uh, an issue uh, this commi committee has uh, dealt with is one you know, you can't regulate on the messaging, so we're removing all that language. Um, uh, we are proposing, so several years ago, in one of the last uh, Bricktown code updates, the, um, uh, the code was changed to say, hey, only certain building uses can have EMDs. And those were uh, parking garages, and uh, spectator sports and entertainment. So basically the ballpark and the big parking garage. The, um, our consultant felt pretty strongly that uh, um, keeping the use distinction was getting a little too close to content regulation. Because you're saying these types of businesses can advertise what they want, but these others can't. So uh, to make it more um, content neutral, uh, we are proposing that to change, instead of going with the uses, that we define the sites by size. So if you're a site uh, 10 acres or more, or 50, uh, what's it say, 50 parking spaces, then you can have an EMD. And if you're smaller than that, you cannot. The rest of these slides, um, uh, just point out that we are moving a lot of the requirements that are in Chapter 3 now, that we're just moving them to Article 16. Murals. Uh, 
uh, we did a lot of work on murals uh, because uh, both um, property owners and artists and staff were frustrated that the uh, process uh, took so long. For example, you know, right now uh, for projects in Bricktown, they have to go to Arts Commission first, then they have to come to a design review, then they go for the permit. So it's minimum two or three months before you can put up a mural. Um, so the new code proposes, it will add, make it clear that art staff can approve murals and that design review staff can approve murals. Of course, that's um, if they meet the regulations. If they don't, then they would have to come uh, to committee. So that, that will cut off many weeks of the process. The, um, another issue uh, relative to, uh, that has uh, been an issue for staff and applicants in interpreting murals is um, uh, the existing murals definition has a lot of um, a description about content. Because um, we, we get murals all the time that want to use uh, the, you know, Thunder logo, for example, um, uh, big text, other pop culture imagery, you know, and um, uh, so far, uh, you know, we've said, we've, because that's what the existing code definition says, is that you can't use, um, you know, product advertising logos, emblems. But that's content related, that's a judgment, that's a content judgment. So we're proposing a new definition that makes it clear that murals are an individual, one of a kind, artistic representation, um, and, and that's it, you know, that's it. Uh, we, I am still working with uh, Arts Commission uh, on the new definition. When I met with them uh, two weeks ago, they made um, uh, a few suggestions specifically about allowing licensed uh, reproductions. Um, another uh, issue about murals uh, that we've encountered in the past several years was what about text? You know, there's, there's a text limit now um, but artists, artists felt strongly that, you know, text, words could be, you know, an integral part of their artistic expression. Um, but at the same time, uh, staff felt uh, we needed uh, some process to, um, uh, to uh, regulate whether or not the, it really was just an avenue for free advertising. Uh, so uh, we're proposing a new process where the Arts Commission uh, can, can review the case and if they believe it is art, then the planning director or the planning director's designee can uh, administratively approve the sign, with, again, without having to go to Board of Adjustment. Uh, so um, uh, we've tried to articulate in the new code um, try to make it clear, you know, what that people will be able to um, maintain their existing signs, repair them, replace the cabinet face, replace the pole, um, uh, do a lot of things to their existing signs without pushing them into a non-compliance, without losing their grandfather status. We, uh, staff felt that was important. And so did industry felt that was important uh, because we didn't want, back to this community appearance issue, we didn't want any uh, property or business owners to not replace parts of, on their sign for fear of losing their non-conforming status. That would, that would defeat the whole purpose, right? We would just have these, these old damaged signs all over the city. So when I say we're being lenient, you know, I don't mean like lenient just to be lenient. It's lenient with a purpose. You know, we want you to replace your sign cabinet if you need to. Um, nothing about the new code uh, will require um, existing signs to come into compliance. They'll only be required to come into compliance if they need to um, enlarge the sign, change its shape, uh, make it taller, make it shorter, things like that. 
Um, so our schedule, um, uh, January, February, I'm uh, presenting this uh, to all of the design review committees and arts commission to ask for recommendation to planning commission, then um, the ordinance will go to planning commission and on to city council. So with that, I am happy to answer any questions and I'm happy to back up to uh, any, any points that you'd like to discuss. Um, I, th this thing is so much more user friendly than it has been in, in the past. I really like the graphics and the, the clarity. Um, I know it's been a ton of work. Um, for clarity, is the, the idea of, of, of limiting or eliminating the use of a PUD or SPUD, I, that's what I got out of it, is that going forward, that won't be an option? You, um, you cannot, you, you cannot, well, um, the original idea was uh, that you cannot vary sign standards with the PUD and SPUD, that the right vehicle for to vary regulations is with Board of Adjustment. But um, okay. then uh, uh, many stakeholders agreed that maybe that was going too far the other way, that if uh, PUD wanted to reduce the number of signs that they were allowed or make them shorter or, you know, reduce them, that's technically a variance, but if they wanted to reduce, they should be allowed to reduce in a PUD. Okay. So y'all are going to have to bear with me on this because this is... I've talked about it a bunch. Um, imagine the, the intersection of Reno and Oklahoma Avenue. At that intersection, you have, you have three parking lots and then the Rock Island Plow Building. So it's largely an undeveloped, and, and then west of the Rock Island Plow Building is yet another parking lot. Right. So has anybody watched the Netflix series um, Midnight Diner, it takes place in Japan? Uh, okay. This thing is so cool. In the opening sequence, we're like flying in an aerial drone shot somewhere in Tokyo, and it's just signs everywhere. It's the Japanese version of Times Square, right? Bricktown's a historic district. It's one of many historic districts. We've got a handful of historic buildings, but we don't have that many, and we got a lot of parking lots. We have a lot of surface parking lots. Bricktown's also an entertainment district. It is an entertainment district more than it's a historic district. If you compared it to, say, Alexandria, Virginia, which is a historic district and an entertainment district, it's very much, it's got this incredible historic fabric of 300-year-old buildings. I mean, not three, buildings that are two to 300 years old. And, and it's crazy. I mean, you're, it's like, wow, I just stepped back in yesteryear and you expect you know, Paul Revere to come walking down the street or whatever. Boston's got historic districts. Some of the oldest buildings in Bricktown are barely 100 years old. Um, it, there, there's not a lot of fabric there. Its future is definitely more as an entertainment district. I would love to see Reno in its connection to the arena, in its connection to the ballpark as sort of this axial thing as it becomes more pedestrian oriented because at some point we're going to spend a lot of time figuring out how to create on-street parking in Bricktown and and that's going to become like one of our great accomplishments if we ever accomplish it is to choke Reno down and make it more pedestrian friendly and create lots of highly competitive on-street parking and in this v vision I have for Reno is for it to be the Times Square of the Great Plains like I, you know, and and I and I want it to be just to where filmmakers are coming in and they're putting their drone and they're flying in, just like that opening sequence. If you haven't seen Midnight Diner, I highly recommend it. It's it's short. It's a lot of fun, uh, and 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 I I I want that for Oklahoma City. I want to see this lit up. You know, tourism is the number three industry in our state. You know, we, 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 we can build on that. 
So with all that said, that picture painted, can we have it in the signed code? Or do we have to do a PUD, and can we still do a PUD? And I know this is like 10 years out, maybe, maybe 30 before we get there, but, and this is gonna get revised between now and then, but right. is so, it possible? Well, <laughs> maybe, yes. The, um, yes, you, one could still do a PUD in Bricktown. So that's number one. PUDs are typically done for use. Uh, allowances. Um, so yes, technically you could do a PUD. If you wanted larger, larger and more EMDs than what are allowed, you could seek a variance. But I couldn't bake it into my PUD. You couldn't, in the PUD, you couldn't exceed. I'm thinking like 85% coverage. I'm not kidding. Well, I mean, uh, this well, no, is what... no, I, well, I, I'm also, well, um, there are few um, PUDs in design districts, just in general, because, um, especially in Bricktown and downtown, because you already have a, a small setback, you already have a plethora of uses, you already have generous height um, allowances. So, you know, to fill, I'm thinking of the parking lot directly, uh, east of the plow building. That can be built out to the street, multi, you know, three to five stories, just period, you know, under the base zoning. And then if uh, you wanted more EMDs than what are allowed now, then that's a variance consideration. And then the, the properties south of Reno are all in a big PUD now that has its own allowances. I broke my mic. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed I forgot that. Okay, yeah. But yes, um, the, um, but to your point, um, so, so this sign code is based on the existing zoning districts. The whole, we're looking at a whole new structure for zoning districts that you'll hear more about on March 4th. So in that process will help further define uh, the context of various areas of town and districts, and if in that it is realized that Bricktown needs to be even more intense than I think is already allowed, uh, then um, that could be addressed there. Also, uh, we will have to come back with the sign code after all the new districts are established. We'll have to update this again in three or four years to make it match the new district. I got a question. Yes. On a scale of one to 10, how excited are you about these changes? <laughs> 10 being the highest. Okay, well, I'm a 12 uh, that we I knew have it. gotten this far. I knew um, you were a 12. I am, um, I am thrilled. I mean, I'm a 10 on many of the issues, on maybe most of them. I mean, the code enforcement piece, I think is gonna be huge, the murals piece. I think it's going to be huge. The content neutral piece is going to be huge. I mean, all of these changes um, that we're proposing, they're individually pretty small deals, right? But I think they've been very responsive to specific stakeholder concerns that we've heard. Um, I think we've gotten a lot of consensus. You know, I don't think we're, we're um, uh, proposing uh, anything that's going to really infringe on business, that's really going to infringe on residents. Um, I, I think we've done a pretty good surgical job. But how, how, how excited are you, Cindy? No? Oh, I, I was going to imagine you were 12.5. So, um, 12.5? I mean, yeah, I'm excited. Oh. I mean, you said 12. I, I was really close. I, I thought it was 12.5. So um, I'm really excited about um, 
I think the work that's been put into this, I think is helpful and I think it will push things along and it will at least uh, bring to, to bear perhaps uh, Richard's vision uh, for, all, for, for all to sort of see and, and deliberate on in Bricktown on its transition from a historic district to the Times Square of the Plains. Um, so, I mean, I think this is great. Um, you mentioned a couple of things about size and scale and things like that in regards to uh, the signage uh, when you were talking about the typologies of use. Like, you, we were talking about parking garages and sports, right? So, um, could you just kind of go back through that a little bit? I feel like I missed a couple of things on what, on what that shift was going to be to. Wanted to make sure I understood it. Sure. Yeah. And, and so uh, when we uh, updated the Bricktown guideline regs in like 2018, I think, I think several people were on the committee when we did that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one thing everyone wanted to look at was EMD signs uh, because of various uh, spuds that had and variance requests. And we had a lot of conversation, Richard, at that time about, hey, to what extent is this a historic district? To what extent is it an entertainment district? What does that physically look to be both? What does that physically look like? How critical are EMDs to that, either more or less? And so in that uh, 2018 ordinance, uh, it was um, agreed uh, for the purposes of the ordinance that only certain use that big, intense building mm -hmm. uses needed EMDs and were an appropriate location for them. And so EMDs were only allowed in uh, the, for the parking garages and for the spectator sports and entertainment uses. Yeah, so, um, and so the shift, I think that's being proposed here, you said something about it actually being more related to size, right? And yes, so instead of, um, so the 2018 ordinance uh, did it on use, and we're proposing to frame it as size, because size is more objective, mm -hmm. and um, because we think we can still capture the intent that you know the larger, more intense structures get the EMDs, and the smaller. Back, you know, I'm actually thinking. I'm walking through Alexandria. Uh, Virginia, in my mind, you know, the smaller shops and businesses get more pedestrian-oriented signage, which is typically not an EMD. Yeah, okay, so like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually walking through as well, because I got lost at Alexandria one time after the metro shut down. It, it, was, it was great. Um, um, so, uh, I'm, so I'm doing the same thing, and I'm thinking about Reno, and it sounds like our pedestrian, uh, I'm, say, I'm sorry, um, are Times Square of the Plains um, in those large parking lots and open areas because it has, I mean, because, because it has those will be conducive. But then I'm also thinking about Sheridan and it's like, so are we also saying, are we also seeing our Times Square of the Plains uh, being, uh, you know, the, our hotels turned into massive EMD billboards uh, as well? Um, because they have those massive uses and the former spaghetti warehouse turned into a giant EMD billboard uh, also. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, 10 acres, I'm like, yeah, like, you know, we looked, I mean, what's the, there's only two or three 10 acre sites. Typical city block is about two and a half acres, uh, yeah. whole block. Yeah, it's the ballpark, so the, ball, the ballpark block and the, um, uh, you know, someone could consolidate the sites east of there. Uh -huh. Okay, and then 50 space parking lots. Is that what I heard? Uh, 50, 50 parking spaces, sites yeah. with 10 acres or 50 mm -hmm. parking spaces. Okay, so like, all right. So not the, maybe not the hotels unless you convert them to garages like uh, First National did. Right. <laughs> okay, got it. All right, thanks. So yeah, if there's no further discussion from the commission, then we are asking you to uh, make a recommendation to Planning Commission and City Council 
uh, on the proposed sign ordinance. So that would be a motion to recommend. I'll make a motion. Yeah, if you make sure you're on the tab oh, across the top that says live meeting, <laughs> then your button should pop up to vote. <laughs> you loser. Okay, so motion passes. Great. Okay, so we'll move on to um, communications uh, administrative approval report. Yes, we just have uh, two items for you uh, this morning uh, before the committee uh, on administrative cases that we've approved at the uh, staff level. One is a, uh, a cellular antenna that's uh, being replaced with um, old, old antennas being replaced with new antennas. And then the other is the uh, replacement signage at the uh, service station at uh, Lincoln and uh, Reno, where they changed over from um, Circle K to Casey's. Do we have any comments on any of these items? Um, from staff, I'll just note, Lisa touched on it already, but we'll have our commission committee training on March 4th um, that morning uh, at the new convention center. And you guys will be getting, I think everyone should have that calendar invite already. You'll be getting a more detailed agenda in the next week or two. Okay. Do we have any comments from committee members? Good to see everyone survive the storm. So. I just uh, wanted to congratulate Mayor Holt on his win last night um, publicly. Um, great, great move for Oklahoma City. Yep. Yeah, I got a comment. I would like to join, um, publicly join Richard McCown's effort to squeeze down uh, Memorial. Not, I'm not on board with the prairie, uh, with the Times Square of the Prairie just yet, um, but I do want to squeeze down Reno and maybe on the record also figure out why we can't get a dedicated lane for the uh, streetcar since you brought it up. Any other comments? Okay, great. Um, so our next meeting date is on Wednesday, March 9th, 2022. Um, and we will adjourn exactly at 10 a.m. Very punctual.